Thank you everybody for joining us for our latest webinar from Cummings Law. I'm joined today by a panel of experts from various areas of the industry and we're going to have a look back at what 2012 brought for us and consider what 2013 might bring. Um, first of all, I'll be joined by Richard Crosby. Thank you, Claire, and thank you for inviting me today. Um, just a little bit about Astia Capital. Uh, myself and my two partners started it uh, two years ago. It is uh, predominantly an advisory business, uh, but we also have been quite successful uh, in very difficult markets in raising assets for, for hedge funds. Um, we tend to concentrate on our, our own, uh, own investments as well. Uh, so consequently, through that process, we work very closely with a number of families and family offices. Um, and we've managed to build, build a fairly uh, successful business over the last three years, and we're having a lot of fun doing it. I'm also joined by Charlie McLean from CMA Associates Limited. Thank you, Claire. Well, my name is Charlie McLean, and I have been in the bank industry for 25 years, um, the last 15 years with Barclays Capital, until June this year when I left to set up my uh, consultancy firm, which is called CMA. Whilst with Barclays, um, my background with them was, for the last 10 years, with, was in the prime brokerage business. Uh, as a pan-Asian sales team leader, I ran sales out there for, for them in Singapore. And then prior to that, I ran the fixed income prime brokerage sales team. CMA is a very bespoke consultancy business, uh, with hedge funds being the clients. We are focused on two main elements. One is recruitment at a senior level, and the second is the critical treasury function, which uh, for the last four or five years has been um, under a lot of strain as the diversification of prime brokers has gone across the industry. Thanks, Charlie. And Ollie Hansen, Vice President of Saxo Bank. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, yeah, Ola Hansen is my name. Um, I work at Saxe Bank in Copenhagen as our head of commodity strategy. Uh, today I'm representing uh, Saxe Capital Markets Limited. Uh, London, London was a fully licensed UK entity on the UK FSA regulations. Um, Saxe Bank is a provider of uh, access to uh, multiple uh, assets across uh, the globe. Uh, we have money, ma money manager products which uh, makes it, uh, make, makes it uh, easy for, uh, for startups to uh, get involved in, in managing, uh, managing accounts. Thank you, Wally. Well, looking back at 2012, I think the, the big story has to be regulation. It's been hitting the industry from all sides, um, offshore, US, European, UK. So taking those in turn, I think the biggest piece of regulatory legislation to affect both the UK and Europe is the AIFMD. Looking forward to 2013, it's due to come into force um, in July 2013, unless there is a delay, which is always possible, because we haven't yet had the final level two rules from the Commission. What we do know, however, is that anybody who is the manager of a hedge fund will be affected and will need to be authorised under AIFMD to some extent to be able to operate and market within the EU. One impact that this is having on a purely sort of legal side is is adding to the increase in popularity of managed accounts. I don't know if that's something that you're finding, Ollie, probably in particular at Saxo Bank. Um, man managed accounts are not going to be subject to AIFMD. Um, and of course, there is the additional benefit of transparency, that of liquidity, and also the fact that you can trade on a notional amount rather than having to put up the full amount for a fund. Looking across the ocean to, to the States, everybody's been acting fast and furious to get, into, get everything into place for the Dodd-Frank legislation. Various parts of Dodd-Frank are coming into force at different times. The majority of the Dodd-Frank regulation will come into place at the end of this month, the beginning of next month. And while some managers are able to meet exemptions, the majority of managers are having to comply with US, US rules. Then turning to offshore, I suppose the place we've seen the most change in, uh, the, in regulation and legal requirements is probably Cayman Islands, where in a master feeder structure, the master fund will now need to be regulated by the Cayman Islands Monetary Authority, which is increasing costs for funds. Um, and also the administrator will need to be regulated in Cayman as well. In the UK, we're not only affected by AAFMD, but also the restructuring of the Financial Services Authority. 
and in 2013 the FCA will become the authority which regulates most hedge funds and those which are already regulated will be able to be grandfathered in. Then finally Europe again where much of the commotion comes from. MIFID II is underway, being negotiated. USITS V has not yet come into force. It will not come into force until probably mid-2014, though some member countries may decide to bring it into force next year to coincide with the AIFMD regulation. But already in June of this year, the EU started consulting on USITS VI. So on the subject of regulation, Charlie, I know a lot of your work involves legislation. <coughs> what, what have you been seeing this year and what do you sort of think may happen next year? Thank you, Claire. Very interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, as I was, as I was just writing a couple of notes here, I, you, you've nailed it. Um, I, I wrote some notes last night and I lead them with it's all about regulation. In, in our world, um, you know, the headline that you see in the press every day is that bankers are being fired in, in droves and all this type of stuff. The, there is an element of that, for sure. The industry is getting smaller. It is being regulated in a much greater way. So a lot of the prop trading elements are now being taken up by the hedge funds. And the, the regulatory gaze is moving towards the hedge funds now, uh, albeit slightly harder for them to regulate a Cayman entity than a UK-based entity. But the, the concept is very much there. Uh, so from a staffing uh, point of view, there is, there is very much demand. Um, but the demand that we're seeing, and this is where the sort of regulation is slightly sort of anti, you know, doesn't really help the industry, is, is that I see a lot of demand in Singapore right now for, for trading related roles, uh, particularly within hedge funds. The other interesting aspect is the, um, one of the roles that we're, we're working on, or one of the three roles we're working on right now, is very uh, close to the OTC um, clearing uh, situation which is occurring. Claire, you mentioned Dodd Frank. Yeah. With with that coming on now, the the Asian firms, the the big brokers and big banks are in a you know there's a lot of entities out there that all under that regulatory rule need to clear their U.S. Um, uh, you know their dollar denominated swaps, and you think of the amount of entities trading dollar swaps in Asia. It, it's it's huge. How many brokers are there to clear those swaps? So and the reason the brokers are limited, the amount of people they can probably uh, load up in terms of clients, is not their, their lack of want. It's their lack of people to help process and onboard these, these type of accounts. So I think that's a really interesting thing. So, so therefore, in conclusion, there's a huge amount of demand, in fact, uh, in places like Asia for OTC uh, clearing specialists, uh, both front office in terms of sales and in the back office area. I'd actually say there's, there's even greater demand in the, in the, in the operational and back office yeah. side. So yeah, and indeed in the OTC market, that's another area in which the EU is active and is looking to bring in new regulatory bodies and a new regulatory regime. Um, a question across the board, does anybody think that this sort of layering of regulation is going to make the industry safer? And indeed, was it unsafe in the first place? Um, I know the EU has said they're bringing in AIFMD as an attempt to prevent an, another um, economic crisis, but they've never actually come out with any report which says that hedge funds were to blame. In fact, quite the opposite. Mm. I mean, there's, there's quite a, a debate about it, that, um, that hedge funds in actuality um, showed the way, if you will, in so much that um, uh, they saw great weakness in, in certain economic uh, policies uh, and consequently uh, traded that way. Um, and clearly one of the big issues I think that regulators have is, is the fact that they're not on top of hedge funds in the way that maybe they would like to be. So our general view is that the, the, the regulations that we're seeing entering into the industry is, is, is somewhat overbearing um, and that reg, in actuality hedge funds themselves are regulated in very different ways in terms of due diligence done upon them, um, how they are perceived in investment portfolios. Uh, we work very closely at Astir with a number of hedge funds, um, some existing, uh, some startups, and um, the amount of information and due diligence that they have to put forth uh, in enable them, enabling themselves to raise assets um, is, since the crisis, uh, probably tenfold more. Um, I, I will say, pre the, the crisis, the, uh, the regulatory environment um, and also the due diligence in environment was was quite weak. Um, uh, but since the crisis, um, I, the due diligence done on some of the hedge funds we work with is um, 
actually can take your breath away. Mm. And I think, it, would you agree with me, it's fair to say that um, the industry's response through things like the Hedge Fund Standards Board and their requirement of uh, comply or explain is actually more flexible, more useful and more robust than some of the European um, imposed regulations coming out? I think, I think it is, simply by the definition of the people that are involved in, in, in the, the self-regulatory environment, mm. if you will, than, than bureaucrats and governments trying to regulate something that they have proven over a number of years they're not very um, knowledgeable about. Mm. Um, so I, I, I feel that, um, as you correctly have suggested, that uh, the self-regulation is probably better than any regulation that will be placed upon them from uh, from agencies and governments. Yeah. Ollie, do you find at Saxo Bank that the level of regulation being imposed on the institutions, so the banks and the clearing houses, as well as on the managers and the funds, is having an impact upon the way you do business? Well, it's obviously, uh, it's, it's obviously creating uh, a lot of extra work. Uh, it's creating a lot of, uh, you have to obviously be completely on top of uh, changes all the time and almost look ahead to uh, being prepared to adjust your systems accordingly. Uh, but yes, it is it obviously, uh, it, is making, uh, it is making life uh, a bit harder, but at the same, same time, obviously, the banks also want to operate on a system where the, uh, the, where the trustworthiness and the reliability is, is, uh, is there, because obviously that seems to have been missing in, in yesteryears. So, um, so yes, we just have to, uh, we just have to adapt and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and look at the beneficial side of things. Yeah. Notice it, I say, is, yeah. Moving slightly away from then sort of the question of whether regulation is going to be for the good or the bad of the industry, Richard, what, what, what kind of things were you seeing in the asset raising marketplace last year and will you be seeing next year, which well, you know, will of course in, include AAFMD? Yeah, it's been, 2012 has been a, a very challenging year um, for, for the hedge fund industry. Um, in terms of performance, it is it's clearly underperformed um, at, across many levels. Um, there are, of course, as always, some very good outliers, uh, but I think strategies that were expected to make money during 2012 uh, with the numerous crises that were uh, appearing in uh, the global economic uh, environment um, just didn't come to pass. Um, and I think um, investors have, um, have, have definitely questioned that over the last few months. But having said all of that, hedge funds have raised a lot of assets again in 2012. Um, the last number I saw uh, for the first three quarters of 2012 was net in, um, inflows of, of 60 billion uh, US dollars in, into the hedge fund industry. Uh, where it is challenging though is that most of those assets are going to big existing hedge funds and startups um, are, are, are very much challenged in, in getting their business off the ground. Um, and that is partly because the, the seeders have changed the way that they operate. Um, the uh, family office seeders that did exist and the hedge fund of fund seeders that did exist uh, have definitely stepped back um, from being as heavily involved um, in that market. So the uh, going on to the point that my colleagues raised just now that there are a number of guys leaving banks to start hedge funds, um, it's a very difficult uh, uh, process. I'd, I'd actually uh, wholeheartedly agree with that uh, statement. I think it's, um, you know, in my old banking days when I had access to this sort of information and you saw the response of, of the industry to it, it was incredible the flows of, of uh, particularly the, the more senior money, the pension money, that type of stuff flowing to the larger to the larger hedge funds. But I do think there is an opportunity for the smaller player to go and work with those larger institutions. Most institutions, particularly the ones in Singapore that I talk to, would be on the look for, um, for smaller boutique style quality managers who just can't raise assets because of the, for the exact reasons you said. And I actually think that becomes a real market over the next uh, two or three years. And um, you know, I'm looking. I'm quite looking forward to that playing out, frankly. Yeah, no, it's it's actually a, a very much a, an area we're we're trying to get involved in at Astir. Um, we know, for example, a number of fairly large hedge funds that are now seeding uh, yeah. small smaller groups, um, and it actually looks like it's going to be increasingly the case and increasingly the business model of startups for hedge funds. Um, so it's. Uh, Again, I agree. Mm, I, yeah, I think if you think about the number of seeding agreements that were put in place maybe five years ago, 
compared to the last year, it's an astronomical rise. Yeah. Yeah. I think, it's, so I think as well, if you look at the uh, the the, uh, the specs of hedge funds and how many small uh, the sizes, uh, obviously we all know the big boys, but there's obviously a whole undergrowth of smaller ones who who quite often struggles against uh, against very punitively uh, expensive costs in in terms of uh, keeping up the whole uh, the whole regulatory system. Yeah. Um, this it's obviously one of the reasons why we we we're getting involved, uh, offering a quite a a money manager platform which is relatively easy to uh, set up where, where we take some of the burden of uh, calculations and uh, updates and uh, away from the away from the client so um, and that's why we uh, that's why we've seen it uh, seen it start to grow uh, yeah. because there is there's a lot of uh, talented uh, young people out there um, some may not come from a investment bank background with a, with a, with deep pockets uh, they, they have they, they need somewhere to go as well where they can they can start up with their idea from a on, from a relatively low cost base. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And what about performance, though? Um, which, as you say, the the reasons for people allocating to larger managers as opposed to smaller ones have changed over the last few years. I see various studies that say the smaller managers are doing better, and then yeah. others which are completely contradictory, that, that saying that yeah. you know, the larger managers are doing better. What's in your experience of raising money for? For funds who sort of straddle a range of AUM size, what what would you say? It's a good question, Claire. Um, there's obviously a great deal of evidence um, over the years of, of, of the hedge fund industry that show that the first three years of investments are, are good years to be invested. Um, but that's a lot to do with survivor bias of, of hedge funds that survive those first three years. Uh, there are a number now of very substantial hedge funds that have grown their assets um, over, even since the crisis uh, and, and done extremely well. What's been challenging in 2012 though, it generally is, has been the performance um, and we've seen some of these very large hedge funds uh, continue to, to receive assets but actually not necessarily perform that well. Um, you know, one could argue it's the, the change in markets which is, has been radical since 2008. Um, the carry trade is no longer and uh, the carry trade wasn't very influential. Uh, provider of alpha in, in the hedge fund industry. Uh, so, uh, you know, our general view is it's tough to raise assets for startups, but there are some very high quality startups. Um, we surprised ourselves uh, as dear when we raised over $350 million for a commodity fund um, that has done, uh, has done very well over the last three years. Um, and I think where investors are looking now are for clever niche managers rather than stock standard hedge fund strategy managers. Um, certainly that's where we've seen the growth um, in, in the industry. Okay. It is all about performance, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it really as, is. as one of my managers says, three key, three key variables, performance, performance, performance. Ollie, performance depends on the markets as well as the skill of the managers. What have you seen over the last year and what do you think will happen with the markets in the next coming year? Is it all going to be about debt, the greenback, gold? You mentioned it basically. <laughs> uh, I think the looking back at the markets uh, as we've seen it like this year, uh, it has been a market which has been easier to steer through uh, on a Panamax than a, a last crew carrier. Uh, the market has been showing lack of momentum, there's been lack of direction, uh, volatility has increasingly uh, come, come down. Uh, we have not really seen any major shifts in, in currencies. Uh, bond markets has been uh, just every move towards ever increasing uh, lower rates. Mm. Um, commodity markets, uh, my my playground has been uh, has been reasonably volatile, but again we're seeing some of the similar similar patterns. We have not had a major trend, maybe apart from the the grain sector section, where we've seen some very strong uh, rallies early in the year, which is now being given back. Um, if we if we move to uh, if we look at some of the uh, our stock markets uh, has generally been uh, doing well we are up on the year but uh, over the uh, during that time we had quite a lot of volatility as well so but also are, are we up on stock markets because actually the value of our currencies is going down yeah there's the uh, there is just a, you need to put your money somewhere and uh, and uh, and that's why stock markets continue to uh, to show uh, decent returns um, company uh, profits are still reasonably okay but obviously they've been cutting back uh, cost as much as they can so um so it, it's going to be interesting into uh, 2013 i think that it's um, 
we may just have a, a couple more cylinders uh, working uh, next year compared to uh, what we saw this year and what we saw uh, just after the Lehman crisis where it really only was China that, uh, that, that pulled us through. Uh, it looks like it's, it's, it's okay in the US, uh, mm. so we could see some pickup in activity there. Probably not the first quarter because this fiscal cliff had just put a lot of investment decisions on hold. So uh, yeah. some, some softness in the first quarter could probably be expected. Um, China is starting to, uh, to come back. It's actually moving towards more domestic consumption. The export uh, is, is, is dwindling, so, uh, so it seems like they are, they are moving on to the second stage where from being an export-driven uh, country, they are mo now more, much more going towards uh, domestic consumption. And that will obviously continue to uh, uh, demand uh, raw materials uh, for, their, for their infrastructure and for, for, for housing and so on. So, um, so it looks like we could have some we could have some decent uh, activity. So that could create some movements, countries. sort of at least in the commodity markets. Yeah. And presumably, then you know, when we start to get some movement and the, the range is being broken, then that will affect the trading style. It seems to me a lot of people have just been trading around their core positions this year, absolutely, because there hasn't really been much else to do. And no. if there's a breakout, then we'll start to get some real activity. That's <coughs> what we need. We need a we need a major move. Uh, we need a major shift in sentiment. Uh, we obviously now seen the uh, the Fed has uh, tied uh, tied their life to uh, to inflation and unemployment. So if we continue to see unemployment uh, lower in the coming months from the U.S., it obviously will raise the uh, the specter, or the market at least will start to uh, speculate when are they going to uh, rein back uh, all this uh, quantitative easing they're currently yeah. doing. So so that will create some uh, interesting moves in the market. Um, so so that yes, there are there are potentials coming uh, in the coming year, but. Uh, the first quarter, at least, will be uh, will be the same as where we where we left uh, 2012. A bit of weakness, uh, which will obviously support the uh, the quantitative easing. Mm. Just on that point of, of of markets and where we're seeing growth, um, particularly in Singapore, ironically, with such a um, an equity centric area of the world in terms of every hedge fund that's known in that part of the world and Hong Kong and and even Australia typically uh, is, is is equity related. We're actually seeing huge demand for for credit. Um, and to go back to your point about currency, uh, the, the core currencies, dollar, quantitative easing and sterling and, and, and the US driving the value of the dollar down, we're actually seeing people starting credit funds and a general demand around credit in, in denominated in Singapore and, and that whole Southeast Asian area. And in fact, companies in Southeast Asia are now looking to issue more debt when typically over the course of the CEO's lifetime, they've, been, they've thought in a very equity-centric way in terms of... Um, in terms of capital. So I think that's a really, really, really interesting shift. And I'm working with three or four firms right now who are looking to get into the credit space next year in, in, in Southeast Asia. Uh, we're also working with, with people on the rate side. And again, I go back to the quantitative easing and the amount of bonds in circulation. People want to trade 24 hours a day. And there is demand for people with fixed income, uh, you know, rate, rate side in, in that part of the world. So it's not all negative. And you raise a good point about the currency, the appreciation, and the, and the diversification taking expertise east. Coming back to a more domestic geography, um, Europe, the Euro, Greece. What's going to happen? Catastrophe? Will the Euro survive? <laughs> good, another good question, Claire. Um, Who knows? I'm not really in the business of staring into crystal balls, but the, um, I think the way I'd handle that is that there is a lot of uncertainty around, uh, around the Western economies, quantitative easing, as you've talked about, Greece and the Euro. And I think at a, at a hedge fund level, to answer it from a hedge fund perspective, um, one side of my business is on the consultancy work that we do with, with, with the treasury areas with hedge funds. They're very paranoid about this. Their clients, their investors are asking them what currencies are we in, what could happen overnight, what's our intraday risk. And with that, we're doing a lot of work with the treasury functions um, when in, in, in terms of intraday analysing where their unencumbered cash is and what currency that cash is in. And if a pension fund wants to have a report on this, they're now looking to the hedge fund managers to be able to provide that. And of course, that's got hugely more complex over the last four years because the prime brokerage industry was typically one prime broker, hence the name, prime broker, for each hedge fund five years ago, pre-07. And then post-08, with the diversification, which again, regulation has caused, a typical big prime uh, hedge fund now has six prime brokers. And if that 
if the investor in that hedge fund wants an intraday report on what currency that guy's trading in that day, he's got to get a lot of data from a lot of data sources, typically lots of prime brokers. Uh, so we're doing a lot of work around that space. And I think that is, there's, again, there's, there's a lot of demand um, we're having from our consultancy side in, in dealing with that. But do you think, do you think that, that risk spreading of where your assets are held, who holds them, the, you know, the custody risk, actually is generated as a response to the regulation? Or actually, it was all coming into place as a response to, to the crisis anyway. That's what the managers were doing. They were looking to increase the number of brokers and counterparties they had so that were there to be some kind of failure, they could jump to another bank. I mean, is the, has regulation helped there? Or actually, was the risk management of the fund manager co community Res responding in a way that would have worked anyway? Well, after the horse has bolted, yes. I mean, mm. Lehman, yeah. Lehman being a great example where you know, many hedge funds got caught up with their assets being at Lehman Brothers and so they've spent many years trying to get some part of those assets back. Mm. Um, but as, as often happens in the finance industry, uh, decisions are made after uh, some sort of catastrophe is hit. So, um, do, you, do you think that means that there is less likelihood of another bank failure, that systemic risk is reduced? If you talk to some of the, 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 the big hedge fund managers out there, they're, they're certainly looking at 2013 with a mixture of trepidation, but also that there could be some very big opportunities out there. And we talked about the fiscal cliff a little bit earlier, and you know, everyone's thinking that there's going to be a solution to that, but it's also going to be a 1% drag on GDP in the United States. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a perfect solution, mm. uh, far from it. So um, banks' failures. Uh, I think now that such is the regulatory environment that, that a bank failure would be very hard to perceive. I mean, certainly European... Uh, the recapitalization of American banks has been very impressive since the crisis. Yeah. Uh, Europe hasn't, hasn't even compared. Um, in many different ways over the last four years. Uh, so if, if there is a worry, it might be in Europe, um, but I think most of the big banks are too big to fail anyway. Mm. Mm. I think uh, we've seen this. We've seen as well with this whole this capsule flow that's going from from south to north. It's obviously uh, putting some pressure on, on banks in the in the southern European region. Uh, it has eased off a little bit recently, but obviously being a, being a Scandinavian uh, based institution, we felt it just like the other Scandinavian countries this year that that has been a tendency of, uh, of funds flowing flowing north. I think just returning to Greece, um, I think the, the, really the, uh, the, the, the main worry now going forward is this uh, high rate of youth unemployment that we, we have uh, seen uh, rise rapidly, especially in southern Europe. Yeah. In Spain we're talking about what, uh, 20, uh, above 25%. How, how will governments be able to control uh, young, uh, disillusioned uh, people? Uh, so there is obviously some, uh, some dangers lurking and it's obviously also the reason why we, we're seeing such a uh, dramatic intervention from the European Central Bank, which obviously Draghi has done uh, has done a fantastic job. You could you could say that uh, by just threatening to throw whatever uh, the kitchen sink at the market, he managed to stop the uh, rot last year. And without having spent one euro, they actually managed to uh, to bring uh, investors into back into southern Europe. So uh, so um, they're starting. We're starting 2013 on a relatively good good footing, but all the problems that brought us here in the first place are not really, are still not really they're, been dealt They're with. still under, yeah. Well, shall we try and end on a positive note? Um, Charlie, what about you? Positive elements for 2013 that we can look forward to? Oh, I think I'm, I'm hugely positive. I mean, if you, look at the, if you look at the cycles of markets and how they've got, you know, expanded by over liquidity through sort of 2001 to, to create this boom that we just had and then the, the contraction and the, the freeze up of the money market, it just, it's just got extreme on both sides and it got extreme on the upside and now it's extreme on the downside. You know, you're seeing divisions, quality divisions being shut down by banks now. I, I, you know, UBS shut down their fixed income division in, in, in Asia. It was a quality outfit by, by general opinion. Um, I'm not taking a view on this, but, but I think when you start seeing major parts of, 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 of banking industries which are successful being shut down, you know it's somewhere near the bottom of the cycle. Yeah. 
And I think, um, you know, the, the amount we talked about young talent and there's people in, in Spain that are unable to get jobs. I mean, at a personal level, we've just hired a, a, an au pair at home who's got an economics degree, a first class economics degree, and she's an au pair for it. She's Spanish, and the reason is she wants to get into banking and she wants to learn English to a high standard before she does it. Very thoughtful. She's got the degree, she's working for a year, she's gone in June, she's going to get a job. Mm. You know, I, I think there were a thousand people that apply, or 1,250 emails we got when we advertised for that role from Spain so I think and they all had degrees there's a huge amount of talent out there there's a huge amount of talent that are willing to work really really hard and I think you've just got to be um, you've just got to be you know you go back to the potato famine in, in Ireland a few centuries ago what happened to New York after the potato famine in, in Ireland a huge boom new talent new people mm -hmm. desperate to succeed yeah. and I, pos I think that's going to be the case here maybe, maybe not be in London but maybe in other parts of the world I think probably in London as well I mean certainly the people that we see coming to us with new ideas are just phenomenally bright phenomenally yeah. hard working you, you know quite, terri quite and, terrifying you, you know say. to that point Claire if they don't want to go in the typical route of, of working for you know the Linklaters or Goldman's it, it, to go into the top industries because financial services within these this area is at a five-year low that the graduates that have been through their whole graduate lifestyle mm. I, uh, lifetime i.e. five years and I think I'm, I'm gonna do something in commerce or I'm gonna go into be an entrepreneur mm. and that's got to be quite a good thing for the economies in general and that's also got to be the start of, of the next cycle. Picking up, yeah. Oli? Well, I think the, uh, there are some, some bright spots as well because um, one of the themes I think we're going to see in, uh, over the coming years are reshoring. We're seeing uh, jobs moving back to... Uh, at, at, now we're seeing the US, uh, Apple has started to move back from China. Other companies are joining in because it's, uh, it, the, the price, uh, the level of salaries in a place like China has risen so fast yes. that it's now starting, uh, states in the US can now compete. Correct. Um, the same thing probably goes for Southern Europe. If the, if the, the, if the legislation is in place and, uh, and, and because you have the, you have the hungry, uh, well-educated people who's prepared to, uh, to give the, who's not, uh, who's, who don't mind working more than 35 hours a week. Yeah. Mm. So yeah. uh, reshoring, I think, could come to Europe as well. Uh, Southern Europe, they are desperate for, for, for jobs and, and it's just putting the right uh, legislative uh, framework in place for that. I think uh, in, the, in the money managers and in the investment community, I think it's also good news that I think there are increased uh, focus on the, uh, on the smaller on the smaller startups because, and smaller many money managers who want to get into this business and there are better opportunities for them now to, uh, to get on the ladder. Uh, with offerings uh, being provided. Yeah, yeah, exa yeah, exactly. Richard, does that chime with? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's um, it's been a tough year, 2012. I think, um, as as my colleagues say, there's that there are some great opportunities beginning to show themselves in 2013. I go down to Greece quite often, and um, in the little village where I live down there, um, they there's a whole bunch of new shops. Um, the traditional Greek shops are coming back, the, the Starbucks and the Hagen Dasses are leaving. Um, and you're seeing a lot of uh, startups in, in Greece. Uh, one, one can just look at the Greek bonds over the last month, which has been a, a phenomenal uh, movement there. One or two hedge funds here in London have, have started to invest in Greek equities. Um, and in fact, one of the most successful macro funds this year has made a great deal of money in the last quarter simply by trading Greek bonds and Greek equities. So, you know, there are opportunities, uh, always, always will be. Um, you know, the US economy looks very interesting right now. The, the whole en energy equation there has changed dramatically in the last two or three years. Um, and, and so one has to feel, again, that the US might be coming out of this quicker than anywhere else, um, which gives some optimism, of course, as well. Uh, still worry about Europe. Uh, I think Europe's going to be challenging next year. Um, but there are some signs of health. Thank you, Ollie. Well, I think it, absolutely that's uh, that's correct, and that's also what we're seeing. Um, there is no doubt that the politicians for the last five years has been doing extend and pretend. Um, it's not really they're not really dealing with the uh, the real issues. And but what's really what's really required is to just leave the the, the smallest companies on the alone. Uh, the microeconomy is where the growth is going to come from. Mm. That's those are the ones mm. who's going to go out and yeah. employ people. Yes, the big yeah. the big uh, international companies are are much more reliant on 
on glo- on growth. They can't really grow much faster than the economies are growing. But obviously, the micro uh, micro situation is a, is a complete different picture. So, so that's where we that's where we're going to see this uh, the world be, uh, being safe from, especially in Europe. And uh, if it comes from from southern Europe with smaller enterprises uh, starting to see an opportunity. That would be fantastic. Thank you, Wally. Well, thank you to everybody for coming today, and thank you as well for joining us. Um, May we wish you all a very happy and prosperous 2013.